Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, ich darf Sie zur heutigen Antrittsvorlesung des neuen Professors für Fernerkundung, Dr. Tobias Bolch, an der TU Graz recht herzlich willkommen heißen. Um dem Ganzen einen feierlichen Rahmen zu geben, findet die heutige Antrittsvorlesung im Rahmen des Geokolloquiums statt. Das Geokolloquium, wie Sie wahrscheinlich wissen, ist eine Veranstaltung der Grazer der, der Geodäsie-Institute der TU Graz sowie dem Institut für Geografie und Raumplanung der Universität Graz und findet viermal im Semester statt. Üblicherweise obliegt es dem Dekan der Fakultät, einen neuen Professor vorzustellen und an der TU Graz willkommen zu heißen. Leider ist Kollege Jussi Bernd verhindert. Er hat heute den Rektor der ETH Zürich zu Gast und auch seine Stellvertreter sind verhindert, da sie auf Dienstreise sind. Deshalb haben Sie mich gebeten, als Leiter des Instituts für Geodäsie, Tobias Bolch, Ihnen heute kurz vorzustellen und an der TU Graz zu begrüßen. Ich darf vom Dekan, habe ihn gerade vorher noch getroffen, und von Werner und von seinen Kollegen die besten Grüße an Sie übermitteln und natürlich auch an dich übermitteln. Ja, dann darf ich dich vielleicht kurz vorstellen. Dr. Tobias Bolch wurde in Deutschland geboren. Im Jahr 1999 schloss er das Diplomstudium Geografie mit dem Schwerpunkt auf physischer Geografie an der Universität Erlangen, Nürnberg in Deutschland ab. Sein Doktorat schloss er 2006 ebenfalls an der Universität Erlangen, Nürnberg mit dem Thema GIS und fernerkundungsgestützte Analyse und Visualisierung von Klima- und Gletscheränderungen im nördlichen Tianjin mit einem Vergleich zur Bernina Gruppe in den Alpen ab. Im Jahr 2012 habilitierte er sich in physischer Geografie an der Technischen Universität Dresden und dann habilitierte er sich 2018 an der Universität Zürich um. Seine wissenschaftliche Karriere führte ihn als Postdoctoral Fellow an die University of Northern British Columbia in Kanada, als Group Leader an die Universität Zürich und als Vertretungsprofessor an die Universitäten Erlangen-Nürnberg bzw. Hamburg. Zuletzt war er als Lecturer und Reader an der University of St. Andrews in Großbritannien tätig. Tobias Wolf ist Autor und Co-Autor von mehr als 130 Publikationen, hat zahlreiche Fellowships und Auszeichnungen bekommen und ist seit fünf Jahren als Highly Cited Researcher vom Web of Science gelistet und seit 1. Jänner 2023 eben Professor für Fernerkundung am Institut für Geodäsie an der Technischen Universität Graz. Nachdem dein Antritt ja doch schon einige Tage her ist, konnten wir dich als Kollege, beziehungsweise konnte ich dich als Kollege schon ein bisschen kennenlernen und natürlich auch dementsprechend wertschätzen lernen. Ähm, wichtig wäre zu sagen, dass mit, dem, mit der Neuberufung von Tobias der Generationenwechsel an der Grazer Geodäsie im Professorenkreis nun abgeschlossen ist ja, und wir mit dir als Verstärkung positiv und sehr optimistisch in die Zukunft schauen können, was die Forschungsthemen anbelangt, aber auch was die universitäre Ausbildung anbelangt und können das auch entsprechend vorantreiben. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir dich an der Technischen Universität Graz und an der Geodäsie begrüßen dürfen, wünschen dir alles Gute und freuen uns auf eine gute Zusammenarbeit. Wir freuen uns jetzt aber auch schon auf deine Antrittsvorlesung. Du hast mir gesagt, du wirst quasi deine bisherige Forschungstätigkeit Revue passieren lassen und auch einen kurzen Ausblick wagen, wohin äh, die Reise an, der Arbeits an deiner Arbeitsgruppe dich noch führen wird. Wir sind schon sehr gespannt. Ähm, bevor wir in den Vortrag einsteigen, darf ich Ihnen noch sagen, dass Sie am Ende des Vortrags natürlich haben die, Möglich äh, die Möglichkeit haben, Fragen zu stellen und danach im Rahmen eines get togethers den neuen Kollegen auch persönlich kennenlernen können. Damit genug der einleitenden Worte. Tobias, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Ganz, ganz herzlichen Dank, äh, Philipp, für die wirklich netten Worte, die liebe Einleitung. Ich muss sagen, ich fühle mich hier wirklich sehr, sehr wohl. Ich habe gerade auch mit Felix darüber gesprochen. Ähm, aus verschiedenen Gründen. Das werde ich vielleicht danach auch nochmal weiter erläutern. Ähm, ich schätze die Kollegen wert, ich schätze die Umgebung hier wert, ich schätze die Möglichkeiten Zusammenarbeit mit Firmen, über die Straße, wir haben Research, Wechsel ähm, mit der KFU. Also es ist wirklich eine sehr, sehr schöne ähm, Umgebung. Und was mich unheimlich freut, dass auch wirklich viele Studierende da sind. Das liegt mir selber sehr am Herzen, denn wir als Professoren sind ja nicht nur da, um exzellente Forschung zu machen, sondern auch um exzellente Studierende auszubilden. Und 
das, was ich bisher mitbekommen habe, war wirklich so, dass ich wirklich die sehr engagiert sind und wirklich auch hervorragende Studierenden sind. Und herzlichen Dank, dass so viele heute gekommen sind. Ich möchte, well, I switch sometimes to English. Most of the time I will teach, well, not teach, I will give a lecture in English, because online there's also my group, and most of my group are not German speaking, but they're English speaking. But um, I will certainly also highlight some important things in German. So my outline of the talk will be after the introduction. I will present about the methods I apply, or me and my group developed. I will talk about the long-term evolution of glaciers and rock glaciers, about identification and relevance of glacial lakes. As I'm a geographer, I'm also interested in the impact of what we are doing. So I will also talk about the impact of crisis changes. And then elaborate about some thoughts about the research perspectives of Austria within this department, and then I will finalize with some conclusions. Um, am Anfang möchte ich euch ein bisschen was über mein anderes Leben vorstellen. Um, das möchte ich auch so ein bisschen als Person kennenlernen. Das hat mir auch sehr gut gefallen, als ich meine Berufungsverhandlungen hatte. Ich hatte auch ein Angebot in Hamburg. Um, in Hamburg ging es sofort zur Sache. Hier durfte ich erstmal wirklich über mich persönlich erzählen. Und das fand ich sehr sympathisch. Denn letztendlich möchte man auch in einer Umgebung arbeiten, wo man sich wohlfühlt. Und dazu gehört es auch, dass man jemand persönlich etwas kennenlernt. Ich bin jemand, der reist sehr gerne. Und wie Sie hier im Bild sehen, ich war in Island, habe im Reiseführer in Island nicht ganz mitgeschrieben, aber sozusagen the most challenging regions im Hochland, in den Westjorden, war ich mit dem Fahrrad unterwegs. Ich habe dort auch Bekanntschaft mit dem jetzt schon gemacht direkt nach meinem Studium, nach, meinem, nach meiner Schule und während meines Studiums. Und vielleicht ist das auch der Grund, warum ich letztendlich mich für die Gletscher so interessiert habe. Ich glaube, wenn es mit meiner Tochter in einer Woche für eine Woche nach Island ging, äh, ist auch fasziniert von dem Land. Ich habe nach dem Studium der Geografie in einer Firma gearbeitet als Altlastendetektiv. Ich habe eine historische Recherche gemacht. Ich habe dort erstmal die Luftbilder ausgewertet und dann ging es darum zu schauen, wo sind Altlasten einer alten Glasfabrik. Und auch da habe ich schon Bekanntschaft mit der Presse gemacht, da es dann wirklich wichtig war für die Ortschaft, wo ich war, wie geht es mit dieser alten Fabrik weiter. Ich habe ähm, an der Universität Erlangen-Nürnberg auch gelehrt, habe dort, ich habe für ein Jahr an der Firma gearbeitet, wo ich für das Army auf Truppenübungsplätzen äh, Environmental Research durchgeführt habe mit Fernerkundungsdaten, mit Modellierungen, den ein, die Auswirkungen des Übungsbetriebes auf die Landschaft, auf die Umgebung ähm, untersucht hat. Und das habe ich weitergeführt und habe die Studierenden auf den Übungsplatz äh, geführt und habe ihnen die Auswirkungen gezeigt und habe dann mit den umliegenden Gemeinden auch gesprochen. Und das wurde auch wiederum in der Presse echt schön wahrgenommen. Letztendlich aber, oh, das passt ja gar nicht, ich will das hier wegziehen. Das sehen Sie auch, wenn wir das irgendwie wegmachen, klein machen, dann haben wir wirklich nicht. Gut. Ah, nein, das will ich nicht. Kann, kann ich das? Nicht, dass das Ganze weg ist. Hi, Winter. Okay, sorry. Ähm, ich hab, bevor ich die Schule beendet habe, das zeigt ein bisschen meine finanzielle Interesse und auch mein, mein Charakter. Ich habe Gitarre gespielt, habe in der Band gespielt, habe für zehn Jahre in meiner Heimatstadt im Gitarrenladen gehabt. Und irgendwann musste ich mich entscheiden. Ich konnte nicht äh, exzellent als äh, Manager sein in der Firma, als sozusagen Manager eines Gitarrenladens. Und letztendlich habe ich dann gemerkt, äh, Musiker sind faszinierende Menschen, aber letztendlich haben viele auch nicht so viel Geld. Und dann habe ich gedacht, ich habe letztendlich in der Firma dann nie mehr Geld verdient und habe dann den Gitarrenladen aufgehört. Und noch heute, wenn ich in meine Heimatstadt komme, sprechen mich Leute an und ich kenne und kann mit den Leuten ein Bier trinken. Also war wirklich sehr, sehr schön. Und ich habe auch für mich unheimlich viel mitgenommen. Denn letztendlich, man ist für die Kunden da, genauso wie hier. Hier sind sozusagen Kunden, Studierende, da letztendlich muss ich auch Werbung machen. Und ob ich jetzt Werbung für meine eigenen Artikel mache und die dann entsprechend zitiert werden, oder Werbung für meinen Laden, das sind durchaus gewisse Gemeinschaft, Gemeinsamkeit. Ich möchte aber auch meinen Vorgänger wirklich danken. Ich denke, also wenn man neu anfängt, weiß man nicht, ja, wie ist es? Wie, wie hat es mein Vorgehen gemacht? Wie, wie verstehen wir uns? Wir haben wirklich ein gutes Verhältnis. Ich sage ganz herzlichen Dank für die Unterstützung. Ähm, Matthias ist ja vor allem bekannt für Umweltmonitoring, Waldmonitoring. 
ich bin jetzt bekannt für Gletscher, Permafrost, Hochgebirge. Passt das irgendwie zusammen? Aber ich dachte, das ist jetzt eine komplette Änderung. Naja, also erst einmal habe ich auf die Website geschaut, Matthias ist eigentlich immer noch da. Wenn man auf unsere Website schaut, da ist Matthias immer noch der Professor und du bist ja noch aktiv und das freut mich. Ähm, du bist Diplom Forstwirt. Jetzt sind ich auch kein ausgebildeter Geodät. Ich bin Diplom Geograf, auch kein ausgebildeter Geodät. Aber ich habe einen Nebenfächer Physik, Informatik gemacht. Ich habe auch damals schon mich für Vermessung interessiert. Ähm, also ich habe schon immer Affinitäten und das Gleiche geht für dich auch. Das heißt, und was mir unheimlich gut gefällt, ich habe ja schon gesagt, ich habe ein Angebot auch in Hamburg gehabt, letztendlich wie die Lehre aufgebaut wurde, letztendlich auch anwendungsbezogen, wirklich die Technik gut gelernt, aber auch die Relevanz, was wir machen, dargestellt für die Studierenden in den Lehrveranstaltungen. Das hat mir sehr gut gefallen und das ist vielleicht auch ein Grund, warum ich jetzt hier bin. Ich habe noch ein bisschen weiter geschaut. Er hat Hobbys Lesen und Musik, habe ich zumindest auf einer Website gefunden, wo ein schönes Bild von mir ist. Ähm, wir haben gehört, mit Gitarre ist ja auch ein bisschen Musik. Also da gibt es doch eine Gemeinsamkeit. Wenn man jetzt noch weiter schaut, habe ich noch eine weitere Gemeinsamkeit gefunden. Ähm, es gibt einen Artikel von Matthias in den Earth Proceedings 2005, Assessment of Parameters for Avalanche Modeling by Means of Laser Scanning and Aerial Photos. Avalanche besteht aus Schnee und Eis. Es sind Naturgefahren. Ich interessiere mich auf Naturgefahren. Und letztendlich ist ja Wald auch wichtig, um zu wissen, wo ähm, treffen die Lawinen auf das Gelände. Ich habe in den gleichen Tagen auch teilgenommen und letztendlich nur ein paar Seiten vorher ist mein Artikel erschienen. Ich muss den ersten Teil der Studien Geomorphology in Glaciers und High Mountain Asia. So, letztendlich haben wir uns schon da wohl getroffen und irgendwie hat das Schicksal uns zusammengeführt. Ähm, und ich finde, das war wirklich ein schönes äh, Schicksal. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Und wir haben durchaus bisschen was gemeinsam. Ich möchte aber auch sagen, Wald ist unheimlich wichtig, auch in meinen Untersuchungsgebieten. Denn hier, wenn Naturgefahren, wenn es zu Murenabgängen, wenn es zu Gletscherseeausbrüchen kommt, ist es ganz wichtig zu wissen, welche Bereiche sind mit Wald bedeckt, welche nicht. Denn dieser Wald schützt. Es gibt Wald sogar auf Gletschern. Mein Doktorvater hat solche Dinge untersucht. Das heißt, das ist das Malaspina Gletscher. Das heißt, auch da ist der Wald relativ wichtig. Und auch auf Blockgletschern, die ich auch sehr gerne untersuche, gibt es Wald. Gibt es Bäume. Ich meine, gut, Wald ist es nicht, es sind eher Einzelbäume, aber sie gibt es. Wenn man den chronologisch untersucht, ähm, wie bitte? Ja, yeah, I'll switch into English, no worries, no worries. Um, very soon. Weil well, das, das war mir jetzt wichtig, das auf Deutsch zu sagen, weil ich meine, die meisten verstehen hier Deutsch. And so I, I will switch to English very soon, actually. The next slide, this is where I want to, to change to English. It's my research area. I'm fascinated by, by high mountains. I'm fascinated by foreign cultures. And uh, for some reasons, um, I had the chance to start my research in high mountain Asia. So about snow and ice in this vast mountain regions, I started uh, with investigations in northern Tian Shan and then had a project about uh, the glaciers in the Arctic regions, actually with Manfred Buchartner, he is in the room here. Um, luckily, in Austria, we're not far away from mountains, so basically quite similar. Um, we have lots of glaciers, we have snow, we have similar characteristics, so it really fits very well that I'm now here. I can transfer what I've done, not only in high mountain Asia, also in other areas, other high mountain areas. I've worked in Switzerland, the Swiss mountains, to the Austrian Alps. But why do I do that? When you think about why do we investigate glaciers, why do we care about mountains when we live not directly in the mountains, but we live in the forelands? I participated in a well-recognized studies about the importance and vulnerability of the world's water towers, where we quantified on one hand the water delivery from the mountains consisting of precipitation, snow and ice melt, but then also the water demand in the lowlands by the population, by irrigation, by the industry. And what you see here quite nicely, that here in high mountain Asia, the water tower index, so the importance of the mountains is highest on earth. And this is also recognized um, by many, many researchers and also funding agencies. But you see also that we have here um, quite an important area of where we are living, 
for the Rhine, the Rhone, and the Danube River, where the mounds are quite important for the runoff for the rivers until the snout, which I will show you in my one of my last slides. So you may know that the Himalayan glaciers were scarcely researched until something like 2006, 2007, that there was an error in the IPCC report um, that the Himalayan glaciers will likely disappear by the end of 2030, hence seven years from now. And I had the honor to basically summarize the knowledge and clearly show that this was not the case. And this was published um, in a quite recognized journal. It's my most cited papers. And basically what we found is that most of the glaciers are clearly retreating, but not at a rate that they will disappear in 2030, but they will disappear around 2100, 2200. But there is also a region in the Karakorum where there are glaciers which have somehow heterogeneous glacier behavior, which means some rapidly advancing glaciers, some rapidly retreating glaciers. And I summarized research from others in nature where I could show based on research from others that really um, Asian glaciers are reliable water resources. So you may know that the monsoon is variable, but the glaciers, they are, melt, they are melting all the time. Even though if there's low monsoon, if there's a drought, those glaciers provide important runoff to, for the society. So it is important to know how they change, how they changed in the past, and how they will change in the future. And when you now look at what we know now, just basically 10 years later, we know there are three studies which are summarized here, in addition with many other studies, that we know for almost every single glacier how those glaciers changed during the last 20 years, which I really think is amazing. And this is due to the advancement in remote sensing, advancement in the computer power. And we see here, that's what I mentioned, in the Karakorum, we have some areas where the glaciers have been in balance or even advanced or had positive mass balances uh, during the last um, 10, 20 years. And even here in Western Kundlun, at the edge of the Tibetan Plateau, the glaciers have been in balance or really positive uh, for a long period of time. And now, since one year or now, it's, it's two years, we have really based on a marvelous work of uh, French colleagues and an in international group, for almost every single glacier on Earth, we know how they change with some uncertainty, um, which I really think is amazing. And this is also an amazing data set. But um, we have a huge knowledge, but there is still a lot of gaps we need to research. The most, and this is one of the downsides, use one static glacier inventory. So we, when we look at the surface elevation change, we first need to know where the glaciers are. And it's needs, you think it might be trivial, but actually it is not. It's not trivial to know how glaciers, where glaciers are and how they change. Most studies cover only um, the period after 2000, because only then um, the glacier, the satellite imagery were available at a regular basis. But really to understand how glacier changes, change, long time series are needed. Most cover only very few periods, only a larger region in time, for example, GRACE, which is a very great data set and puts a lot of insights into the glaciers, but it's very difficult to study single glaciers with GRACE or they're extrapolated from very few, very important, but still few in situ measurements, like where you really go on the glacier, you measure how they melted, you also measure the, the density. How do we know where the glaciers are on Earth? Well, some you see, you can use aerial images, but to automatize the mapping, you would need more information. And when you think about how remote sensing works in general, uh, well, you have the reflection curve of a different surface properties with the different wavelength. And as you all know, snow is very bright in the visible wavelengths. You see snow is white, but what you might not know that there's almost no reflection in the shorter than red band. And if you use this information, you can very easily delineate snow and ice. So you have here the reflectance in the red band, for example, uh, you have in the near infrared band, it is here where the ice, where you have coarser grain size, has a lower reflectance and is therefore 
darker than the eyes, and we have here in the short wave infrared black almost no reflectance. And here you can nicely visually see how you could delineate, and certainly also the eyes is cooler, so also the thermal information you can get information about where glaciers potentially could be. But what we typically do um, since many years now, uh, we generate a ratio image, um, divide one band where glaciers reflect highly with a, by a band where glaciers reflect very low. So this rear band divided by the red band or vice versa, and to have a ratio. And there's some slight difference if you use the red band or, or the near infrared band, but overall it's very straightforward. Um, we assume we need to know where waters are because they are also here included. We could calculate with the NDVI, but also with the normalized difference water index. With the NDVI, we, did, we also can nicely detect vegetation, so the normalized difference vegetation index. And so we have the final glacier mass and a very simple land cover classification. This is done within really seconds for large regions. And this one was actually published together with a colleague, Ole Kam, um, during a time where I was, well, there, yeah, it was oriented race, right? It was just at the beginning. And it was actually published in the Grabzer Schriften für Geographie und Raumforschung. Um, so basically here, so these are really my second connections to Graz. And when you look, I would say it's one of the most cited papers of this Schriftenreihe. It's almost cited uh, 200 times. So it's not too bad for a paper which is not peer ready. Um, and if you apply this, um, you can just do large areas, which I did in my postdoc at the University of North of British Columbia. Uh, where I was responsible for generating a glacier inventory uh, within one year. And uh, my, my mentor, Brian Nunos, he said hello to me and said my predecessor, he was able to publish three papers in one year. And I said, what, three papers? At that time I had only two. And so I could publish three papers in one year. Actually, I didn't manage, I only published one, but it's the most cited paper um, of my advisor, I guess. Uh, so it's not too bad. And what you also see, it looks pretty easy. Right? You just have a ratio, some manual delineation, and then it, that's it. And so we have information we don't need to know, but maybe for, for every single glacier, not how the elevation change, but how the area change. And roughly about between 0.3 to 1% um, per year. But when we look then in the detail, it's not that easy. Uh, that's an example of a paper of a um, colleague of mine from, from Japan, uh, which is the famous Kumbu Glacier. Here's Mount Everest. You need to would think everyone knows where the glacier is, but these are outlines from different inventories, and you see they do not match. And you see from the satellite imagery, well, here is no snow, but on the high resolution imagery, there's a little bit more snow. So where is really the ice underneath? What is really a glacier, what is not, is not that trivial. And here, I some looked at another region in, in the Hunter Basin, the Karakorum, where just look at that. We have different glacier outlines, which are all used from Isimot, the Gundam inventory generated by the Chinese, the quite famous Randolph Glacier inventory used other outlines. And you, you see there's a lot of variation in the upper glacier reaches. There's a variation in the lower reaches, which actually are true because those are certain glaciers. And there are also some glaciers which are omitted, which means it's not at all trivial to really delineate where a glacier is. So there's still lots of research. Um, well, we have now Sentinel-2, which has a high resolution. I, I think you would agree with good knowledge. You could somehow estimate that there is an outline, but here it's definitely sharper. So you can do a better job, but still the shadow, it's, it's definitely with challenges. And we here we have the famous Kumbu Glacier. And some people think this is part of the glacier, some not, some do, draw the outlines here. So we still need some more methods to really be able to know whether there's ice underneath and how um, the glaciers change. And one of the methods is object-based image analysis. So combine the um, information of the pixel of uh, the shape of the glacier and also additional information like the, the um, topo topographic character characteristics, the surface slope, or the surface roughness. And this was done by a PhD student of mine during my time at the University of Zurich. 
And by the way, I would have loved to visit um, also the talk by the colleague from ETH Zurich because of very good connections to ETH, so it's really a pity. Um, but certainly this is much more important, um, but it's simply an um, unfortunate coincidence. So what we looked, we looked at the surface temperature, the surface slope, weighted the different factors, looked at the compactness, the shape. We all know that glaciers should be elongated if they are valley glaciers, for example, um, provided some classification based on this information, had some post-processing, fine classification based on the context and neighborhood analysis. For example, we know if you have elongated features um, on a glacier, this is a median array. If it's surrounded by glaciers and it's very elongated, then it should be part of the glacier, even if the spectral characteristics would say um, this is debris, which is actually true. When you look at the final results, so this is the best we could achieve based on the pixel-based approach, so using thermal information. It's not too bad, right? But you see it's pixelated even after um, filtering the uh, fear areas, which are not glaciers. Here, this glacier is divided in between, so we put a lot of effort in. And when you look here at the object-based approach, it's very clear that it's not ideal, but it's much better, much closer to reality than the pixel-based approach. So we, it's now eight years ago, definitely an important step forward. And additional information, well, we have here lots of debris cover. Um, and it's very difficult to distinguish whether underneath the debris cover is really ice, whether this is a kind of a rock glacier, so it's surface creep, um, which is a kind of a surface, uh, the ice debris mixtures, which creeps downslope due to gravity. Um, most researchers uh, are saying that they are, say that per definition, they are part of the permafrost realm. And so when you look at satellite imagery and look whether there's a coherence, so whether you can get information of the satellite imagery at, this, at the same pixel and you get um, information, then the terrain was stable, and if not, if there's a loss of coherence, um, there must be some movement underneath. So we could use this information, the loss of coherence, which you know, normally don't want, but in this case we want to have it, as an indication that there is ice underneath. And this is what we did, and also look carefully on the surface uh, features. So this was then done manually at the end, whether these are rock glaciers or not. So another possibility to improve the, the knowledge. Uh, rock glaciers are even more complex. I will show you some um, pictures afterwards. So what we used together, uh, Ben Robson, he was a um, research fellow who stayed with me at the at University of Zurich, finalized the paper while he, he has already a position in Bergen, at the University of Bergen. We used convolutional neural networks to identify where potential rock glaciers are. So basically, what a convolution neural network looks um, like here, you have a convolutional layer, which basically scans um, the, the raster image and looks for similarities and identifies similarities. And as it's, uh, it's a deep learning methodology, so it, it checks many, many possibilities and then identifies kind of whether these characteristics could be part of a rock glacier, and if not, then we have a pooling because the major disadvantage of, for example, um, artificial neural networks is that we have huge data sets. And if you want to basically look at large areas, then at our computation power is limited. So what we do here, we pool it, so basically reduce uh, the uh, amount of pixels with different techniques, so reduce the size, and we do this repeat this several times, then have, we have a fully connected layer, which is actually in the end, the classification step, where we define um, thresholds where um, this pixel could be of rock glacier, could be part of a rock glacier, and whether or not. And then finally, we have a heat map, so it's a probability map, whether this pixel belongs to the class we defined um, or not. Because rock glaciers are quite complicated features, we combine this information 
with the object-based image analysis. So we have here um, the, the uh, CNN approach, but beforehand we have an image segmentation, generate a heat map, then we clean up and again check um, different parameters with a more object-based approach, merge the objects, clean it up in a second round, smooth the outlines, and then we uh, have the final results, which actually look quite promising. And this paper, um, well, let me just start with the, with the results. And the blue ones are the training areas, so it's a, it's a supervised learning approach, so we need training areas, we need to know where rock glaciers are. And we selected actually regions where we both have been in the field, so we know also how it looks like, and we have also some more knowledge about the rock glaciers. And this actually is a region in, in Tibet, in central Himalaya, where the rock glaciers are at an elevation of about 5,000 meters. So it caused, caused some headache to go there, but it was definitely worth it. And so basically, there is a good match where you have here CNN Obia with the rock glaciers. There is some deviation, but um, it definitely helps us to identify where potential rock glaciers are. And finally, we and uh, could then improve it manually um, to really have a rock glacier inventory, which I won't touch upon. But I'm in contact with the Chinese colleagues who applied for a fellowship to come to, uh, to Graz, who wants to apply this approach to entire Tibet so that we have a rock glacier inventory for Tibet and then entire high mountain Asia. So we know now where the glaciers are with the best possible knowledge we have, um, and we know how they change in area. But what we really want to know is how they changed in volume, because we know, want to know how much ice was lost during this time. So what we need to know, we need to know the third dimension. And what you can do in photogrammetry, traditional, well, you have an aerial image, for example, acquired from one view angle. Uh, look at that, you have another view angle, right? And so the slope is much sh shorter, and you can have then a triangulation, and basically look at the geometry, and uh, we have different view angles, and then you can generate at the end. Basic principles of photogrammetry. Um, again, quite simple. Um, this is a result. Well, when you have low contrast, then it's difficult to find matching points, but overall, we were quite successful. This is an old image. I will touch upon that later on. And then we compare it to a new, settler, a new elevation model, and difference then, then basically what we see Quite nicely, where you have the red color, the surface lowering, so the glaciers are losing uh, elevation, and it fits quite nicely. There are certainly some uncertainties, which I will touch upon later on, but we could nicely show, or uh, 2011. Uh, there's also a paper with Manfred 2008, which was the first paper which really used the corona image in, in glaciological research. And this is actually another connection to Graz. I know that uh, Bob Koska, you worked also with corona images, and your name research worked with corona images. And actually, I learned from you, Manfred, to use these images. I immediately recognized the potential and, um, well, developed it and convinced Tino Pizzonka, a marvelous uh, student in Theo Dresden, um, to really work with the state. And so, again, it's, well, there's some uncertainty, and, but, it, but when you then look more in detail, and this is the first draw result we got, it looks less convincing, right? You have a tilt, you have some shifts. So what you really need to do you need to proper co-register the, the elevation models so that they are properly aligned, so that we really only look at the real surface elevation change. Then we have to detect what are real uh, signals and what are outliers. So we detect, and we are still, we worked on other methodology to, to detect the outliers, to include information, what we know about knowledge, for example, that at the accumulation region in glaciers, if we typically don't have elevation changes of 20 meters or 30 meters, but they are typically quite less. And there's a kind of a range, what we know um, could be accumulation, depending where on earth they are. And we also know that there is higher surface elevation change at the lower reaches, and how they change also depends where they are and, uh, on the um, equilibrium line altitude. So we developed a methodology, looked at the different parameters, and then basically filtered the outliers and filled them with the neighboring pixels. So that's the typical approach. We generate a DM, we properly co-register them, we difference them, filter the outlier, filter the gaps, then clip the glaciers to the outlines, 
What I don't want to touch upon is right now we have the volume change, but what we want to know is the mass change. And the mass, when the ice is melting, it's ice which is lost, but when we have accumulation, it is snow. Snow has much lower density, and we don't know exact density of the snow. Uh, we know that snow is densifying, so we need to consider this. There are other also remote sensing methods uh, which can support the the, these volume to mass conversion, but I don't want to touch upon that. But in the end, we have the geodetic mass balance. What we now want to know, we want to know a long-term perspective. And I already touched upon the corona images, uh, which is really a great data set where we have from 1961 to 1972, um, we have images with a resolution up to 1.8 meter. Why? Because the Americans were interested in the territory of the enemy, so during the Cold World War, um, so they had really good data sets, put a lot of development in, and when you look at this is Corona, resolution of two meters roughly from the 19, well, early 1970s and 1960s, not too bad. Then we have, well, these were used stereo. We have mono gambit from the 60s with 60 centimeter resolution, which is even better when you think about what we have now. It's almost the equal resolution the metric camera, where we have a metric camera, where the image geometry is easier, it's much faster to process, but the resolution is lower, six to eight meters, but on the same spacecraft, I would call them kind of satellites, which were in orbit during a few hours, and then they had to basically recover uh, the film and a parachute. Uh, we had the panoramic camera with a re resolution of 60 centimeter from the 70s in stereo. A marvelous data set, which was just declassified. And well, again, it, it looks promising, but we have complex image geometry, we have long elongated stripes, uh, we have low contrast, so we need to deal with lots of limitations, but the potential is there, which you nicely see here, basically 1970 Corona, two meter resolution versus the Pleiades, and nowadays almost similar resolution, um, which is not only of interest for glassology, of course, there are many, many other applications. But I want to develop it further. I wanted to develop a methodology to process those images really in an automated way. And I well, advertised the position and I found a really great person from Pakistan, Sajid Kufar. I don't know whether you are here with us, Sajid, um, but he's still joining our meetings from time to time. And so, well, I just briefly mentioned the pipelines and what, what, because of the large image size, they are divided into four pieces, so they first need to be stitched together. And then the KH4B, they have kind of rail holes at the, at the side of the frame of the image, which allows to adjust to some distortions. Unfortunately, the KH4, KH4A don't have this one, but the KH4B have this one, which just gets as a better possibility to uh, reduce the distortion, look at uh, the, the camera model, look at the forward movement for time-dependent modified culinary equation. And basically the heart of the method is, again, deep learning to identify ground control points in an automatic way. This was like Ottoman, I think you are here, you really did a marvelous job, and I will show it later on, really to identify ground control points manually, which is very, very tedious task, but important task in to really look uh, find enough matching points. So use the superglue algorithms based on well Landsat TM or Landsat yeah Landsat TM panchromatic band 50 meter resolution or also planet CubeSat data with three meter resolution to find matching points which actually work quite well in the test area in Inner Mongolia and then stereo rectification so the pipelines which which we need to follow and um, what so this is basically the first result and uh, which with what we differenced between uh, the satellite image and uh, the well the dm generated from the coronal satellite images and the SATM dm so what we needed again is a fine core illustration you see it is not perfect but uh, these are very only changes of one or two meters, which are highlighted there. And when I show you in the next slide, how it looks like over the glaciated terrain, you see very nicely that 
with this really automated method, which, which he applied for large regions, like this is entire central palm here, so really several um, steel repairs, which were um, automatically processed. And you see here, it looks very nice over the glaciers, they have a clear surface lowering. So this is actually generated uh, with remote sensing software graphs, um, and this is the automatic pipeline. When you look at the histogram uh, and the standard deviation, the mean is very similar, the standard deviation is very similar. Um, there's some downside where we have low contrast. You may know those mountaineers amongst you, you know, the Slotze, uh, very steep slope, uh, very low contrast. So here, they, uh, actually both um, methodologies have problems, but here the problem is higher with uh, posit. But overall, really promising, and we could use this information to really generate the ends. And I mentioned now the hexagon panoramic camera, um, which were classified since 2015, but still are not all declassified. Uh, so it's still ongoing. We have a resolution in the Nadia direction of 60 centimeter, which is really comparable to the modern high resolution imagery. And this data set can be really used in many, many aspects for urban research, for archaeological research, how things change, and the data set is well, with a very low cost. And this is how it looks like. It is a side-looking system. Here we have Nadia, and uh, we have the different look angles, and I would say until something like 45 degrees, it's shown here, and you have suitable results, even in mountain ranges, but then the distortion gets, gets smaller. And this process also automatized, and we are currently in particular subject, and um, I'm hoping that if actually a person who, who wrote me today, um, he really want to have a position, he worked with this data set, but um, I'm still waiting for a project to be funded. So hopefully it will be funded, and I can employ a person that he can really further develop uh, what we have done and fully automatize this to cover large regions. Um, but we already did some work with the data set. You may know the most prominent mountain on Earth, Mount Everest, um, where I published already the paper 2008 during my work in Dresden. Um, and we continued this and used all available data sets, including Corona KH4, Corona KH4B, then AVE images which was, were used to generate this map from 1984, and then modern satellite imagery. If you look at that, well, it looks nice, but you don't really see changes, right? It's quite difficult. Um, and there are also no real changes, but where you see some changes are at Inja Lake. Um, we have here a small lake, um, which you could nicely see. There was no lake in 1962, a small lake in 1984, but this lake increased dramatically. Um, we now look at the results. We clearly see a surface elevation change between 1969 and 1984, with the surface lowering, which was, so these are now 15 years, and it's an 80 years period. The surface elevation change clearly increased. And we have now, when we look at the entire period, some areas, Rongbo Glacier really it has lowered its surface by almost 100 meters, and Barron has parts where we have a surface lowering of more than 120 meters in this period, so almost one meter per year. On average, I will show you on the next slide, we had a clearly increase in surface lowering, so increase in mass loss. Um, but we have, if we now look much more in detail, we can also pull more of this. So we, have, for example, also looked at uh, the difference between clean ice glaciers and glaciers which are debris covered. I've shown you an image. The um, average glaciers are average glaciers are mainly debris covered, and you would think about if there's debris on ice, it should insulate the ice and prevent the, uh, the glacier from melting. But the opposite is the case that the debris covered glaciers actually they lose more ice than the clean ice glaciers. Uh, that would be a talk of another one hour, which I won't give uh, you, but if you're interested, and I'm happy to tell you much more detail about the impact of debris cover, but it is basically what we can clearly confirm here that they're losing more ice than the clean ice glaciers, and that those glaciers uh, which are draining into lakes, which are indicated by red, have even a higher mass loss. And yeah, so on, on average, you can, just remember 30 centimeter per year on average 
um, is the surface lowering of the Everest glaciers, but increased now to 40 to 45 centimeters in the recent years. In another publication, Ottenu uh, and others, we looked at different areas, used similar data sets um, like the Priades, um, so the modern high resolution, and the Corona data sets and hexagon data sets to generate time series of surface elevation changes for many, many regions over high mountain Asia. What you see that in most regions, we have a similar increase in mass loss, but so these are basic years, 1969, and so you look at it clockwise. But there's some reasons, for example, where we had a period, like I've shown you in the Karakoram, where the glaciers had been in balance, uh, which is in the eastern Pamir, also Purigangri ice cap, there was a period where the glaciers had been in balance. But what we could show is that in the recent period, even in the areas where the glaciers have been in balance, we are now uh, losing mass, or the glaciers are now losing mass, so the state um, that the glaciers are not losing mass is definitely over, and this is also shown in other publications, but we were basically amongst the first, so our publication was published more or less at the same time that the global study who also identified this phenomenon. Um, well, I'm certainly also interested in what are the causes, and I don't want to give too details, also in respect of time, but you see here, it's still a study slide, but um, I can skip over to some, so don't, don't worry. Um, and there are some nice figures. Um, so, but basically, the main reason is really the increase of temperature, and particularly the increase of summer temperature, really explains the mass loss, while the uh, variability in, in precipitation and explains the variability. But there's one exception, and this is this region, which is Akshirak, where you have an increase in temperature, um, but a decrease in mass, and um, well, so you have a decrease in temperature, but an increase in mass loss. Why is this the case? And this is a specific phenomenon that is called glacier surging, which means, uh, which you've shown in this slide here, that the glaciers basically, within a short period of time, a lot of mass, ice mass is relocated from the upper reaches to the lower reaches. And if it's in the lower reaches, it's there prone to melt, right? So because it's high on this, in this period, this was in, in the Akshirat region, and for the period, we had a lot of surging glaciers. And this can explain that in this region, the um, mass loss cannot directly be related to, to the climate. So as this is an important factor, uh, Grégoire Grier generated an inventory of surge type glaciers using automatic velocity time series for the glaciers because when the surge is starting and is happening, the glaciers are flowing much faster and also surface elevation changes. So these kinds of features which you show here uh, in an automated way and generated an inventory of surge type glaciers of entire high mountain Asia which reveals that in some areas, more than um, a quarter, sometimes 20% of the glacier area are surge-type glaciers, so which is quite important to know and which needs to be considered when you look at the glacier changes in the future. Another possibility to look at long-term changes is, and you will see it later on, is something which I'm happy to apply with colleagues also here in, 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 this, in the Austrian Alps, look at old maps, old staring images. And in Switzerland, this is the best country you can be. They have really marvelous topographic maps. They have many, many uh, aerial images, which we all processed um, with mainly structure for motion. We looked at the different possibilities compared, um, different software packages, PIX4D, uh, Agisoft, and others photogrammetry, so typical photogrammetric approach. And overall, when you look here, the standard deviation, it's relatively similar. It's slightly better with uh, PIX4D. Um, most important is if you have uh, aerial images where you have very little or no ground control points, which is often the case when you have uh, large glacialized areas, then the um, structure for motion approach is really has a major advantage apart from the fact that it's definitely faster than finding tedious ground control points. So we generated a time series, really the longest existing time series 
of glacial changes, which includes also the period where the glaciers in the Alps around the 1980s have been in balance, which you probably know also from here, um, which is nicely depicted here, that the surface increase removed downward and is now visible in the later period at the snout. But now, nowadays, where we have significant surface lowering, we also looked at the different reasons using high resolution imagery. We looked at uh, the velocity using um, terrestrial radar interferometer, which covered the entire glacier. Um, so we really have a nice time series to understand what's happening. But the key was again really having um, different remote sensing data sets to assess the changes in detail for a long period. When you now move um, to, from debris covered glaciers to kind of these features, uh, well, you, have, you all agree that this is a glacier, but you don't really know what this is. I, actually, I don't know either. I call it ice debris landform, um, but it's fascinating. I want to know how they change. Some call them rock glaciers, but I'm not entirely sure because these features behave a little bit different. Uh, but what do you see? You look at the surface elevation change, uh, well, maybe you don't see, but I can show you where the glacier outline is here, where the glacier was in the 1960s. So the um, first date, where, which I used to generate the DM, or actually Ottomar Bhattacharya generated the DM and supported us in this regard. Um, you see that in the fourth field, there's also surface lowering, which you would not expect. While where these rock glacier features are, they look relatively stable. And that's the same at the other area. And actually, this is one where you really have to drive with a Russian military truck uh, for two days and uh, um, well, cross border controls because it's close to the border to China, have a special, special permit. So I went to the military force and uh, just uh, talked a little bit in Russian, convinced them. And in the end, it worked out. And so we could go there and really do um, not only remote sensing investigations. But we used another technique, another, again, coherence, where you could see that there is something happening here, there's something happening here. But if you really want to know what is, what is happening in detail, you would need to use, I would say, in situ remote sensing, so ground penetrating radar, for example, where you see now here nice reflectance. And uh, I was there with some colleagues and also a really nice uh, Russian colleague, Stanislav Kutuzov, he did a lot of work on glaciers and he said, it was the worst ever he did on these rocky, rocky features working and, and really doing the GPR. But this is what I really love. And we had a lot of insights about the ice content, how these features changed. And this allowed us also to generate a geomorphological map and truly really understand better the evolution of these landforms. So these features are really fascinating. They are, they are large. There are many, many of those rock glaciers also in, this, in the Austrian Alps. And just another one, which is called Moreni, like Moraine. Uh, when you look at the circular elevation changes, it looks different. There's a the highest lowering is in the upper reaches. There's actually an increase in the um, low reaches due to the advancement because rock cannot melt away. So when it moves downward, the rocks are deposited and there's an increase in surface elevation. And we looked at the velocity with feature tracking, with interferometric SAR, so basically look at the phase differences of uh, the, the radar beam, which allows us to really estimate surface elevation changes in the centimeter and partly even in the millimeter range, which is, which is really amazing. And you could see where it decorrelates. You have lots of surface elevation changes. And here also indicated uh, with the feature tracking, we have slow movement. So these two methodologies are nicely complementary and help us to understand how these glaciers um, move. So where well, we have overall increased velocities and advanced with the lowering in the upper part, so basically opposite of real glaciers. And this is those who don't believe that rock glaciers are different from glaciers should really know this, that there's a clear difference how those features behave. Um, well, we, we did many other studies, I don't want to walk you through, but basically this study is in line what I present beforehand, that over entire Himalaya or some other areas, those glaciers which drain into proglacial lakes, which are shown here, are losing mass at a faster rate than the glaciers without. So again, important to consider, and none of the models which predict 
um, or project the future, consider this fact for all the glaciers in the Himalayas, for example. So it is important to know where the glaciers are. And when you now look at, well, everything is quite dark, right? Um, but what you see a little bit, this is a lake which is brown, this is a lake which is green, this is a lake which is turquoise, this is a lake where, which is dark, which is dark blue, and here you don't see anything. Um, if you now generate a normalized difference water index, you can nicely identify the lake, even though it's in the shadow, but you have also other areas which are identified as lakes because the spectral reflectance in the shadow areas are similar. And here we have even difficulties to identify because there is ice, a uh, little bit of ice on top of the um, lake. And the major advantage of SAR is not only that it penetrates through clouds, but also that we have a really different backscatter on the glacierized areas. So when you combine this information with kind of a image segmentation based on the NDVI of different NDVIs and the rate of backscatter and combine this with machine learning, in this case a decision tree, where we feed the, um, the computer with information where the glaciers are, uh, where the glacial lakes are, we could significantly improve uh, the methodology to detect the lakes and really also automatize the methodology to so have here the information and the lakes are based on the rule-based segmentation. We see here this lake where we have icebergs, where we have um, a little bit of ice, it is not covered, and also here the Sturbit Lake, where with segmentation and random forest really cover and map almost all those. And this, uh, with many, many Chinese and colleagues, enabled us to really look at the change of the glaciers in the entire Himalaya. And well, this is not novel because there were already studies who did this. But what we did in addition, because what in the, also what we want to know, we don't want to know only the area change, we want to know the volume change. So we went into the field um, together with the Chinese colleagues. Uh, well, this is another story which I can happy to share. Uh, there are many, many anecdotes. And well, un one anecdote I want to share with you. We wanted to measure the bathymetry of a lake, right? And um, they had a rubber boat with us, with them, to measure also other parameters. and. Uh, While well, the Chinese hired Tibetan porters, and the Tibetan porter they could only speak Chinese or Tibet. I cannot speak Chinese, um, unfortunately. But somehow I had the feeling something is, is, is not, not really correct, or they, they wanted to tell us something. And so, me and my colleague, and one Chinese, we were the strongest part of the Chinese uh, from the Tibet, and so they walked up um, to, the, to the glacier lake. We followed, and we went there, and the Tibetans were smiling and such. And we, immediately we saw the, the lake was frozen. And you cannot use a rubber boat on a frozen lake. And the Tibetan knew that, of course, because they know the area. But the Chinese say, well, uh, we, we, we want to measure it, so we do everything we can to reach it. But just think beforehand, um, maybe just look at the satellite image, how the condition is. Well, it was a very short-term decision, so I, I, want, I don't want to blame it. But it was simply very, very interesting, because the Tibetan immediately didn't know, but certainly they got paid for it. Um, and so, well, certainly they want to get the money. And so finally, we had a really nice trip. It was marvelous, but uh, in the end, for nothing. Okay, but, but for several areas, we really did, uh, were successful. So we had the bathymetry and so could relate the information of the uh, lake depth to the lake area. And I really want to thank Guo Jing Zhang, who was uh, one year as a guest scientist with me in, in Zurich. And we are really in a uh, good contact. We have been to several pubs in Beijing together and somewhere else. So he's really a great, great person. Um, and he was leading the paper uh, where we developed the methodology and finally could really show that those assessments of glacier mass plans using satellite imagery underestimated the mass loss of the, of the lake terminating glaciers by 6.5%. Why? Because basically, he has the ice, the ice is replaced by the water the satellite image measures the surface of the water and not the bottom of the lake, so it basically misses an important part of the ice loss. And with this formula, the information how the glaciers and the lakes changed, we could um, measure this and estimate the underestimated mass loss. And this was nicely picked up by the media all over the world, in the ORF, in Salzburg and Nachrichten, somewhere, a website in India and in China. And even the ESA wrote about it, um, and it was Twitter. So it was quite, quite happy um, that it was well picked up. 
Um, but the story was very simple. So this is also something which you need to know if you want to publish in a highly impact paper, you need to have a nice story. I think it's, it's very simple what we did, but it's, it has an impact and we sold it quite nicely. And also uh, Wu Jing and the whole team did a marvelous job. Um, I, maybe I skip it a little bit um, and then move forward. I was thinking I, I need one hour. Well, I still have a little bit of time. Um, but I want to touch upon one aspect, and Patrick also, because Adam is with us and he's working on, on Glacial Lake Outburst Floods, and uh, this is a potential collaboration also with many colleagues from, from the Carvey Grads. Well, when glaciers are retreating, they are forming glacial lakes, which I've already shown. And these lakes are prone to outbursts, not only have an impact on the glacier, but also an impact on the downstream communities. And this is another aspect which I was working um, uh, together with the Chinese colleagues and, and Simon Allen from Zurich, who is an expert in, in these regards. So when you think about you have this glacial lake, um, when there's a rock and ice avalanche falling into the lake, it causes flood waves, and um, the lake is damped by the terminal moraine. And if there's a huge flood wave and the flood wave overtops the terminal moraine, it can cause erosion of the lake, and then all of a sudden, you can see the, the um, lake bursts out and there's a flood wave which just um, flowing into the into the lower areas. And when you look at the hazard level, so the probability or likelihood that an, an outburst can occur, we have in many, many areas, certainly mountain areas on the Tibetan plateau, and in particular in the northern slope in the Himalaya, we didn't look at the southern slope, it's also well known there, uh, we have a hot spot of those um, lakes which could potentially burst out. But if there's nobody there, if there's no person living, no infrastructure, we don't really care too much. But in case there's an impact on livelihood, on life, livestock, uh, infrastructure, then we definitely care. And the hot spot is the southern slope of the Himalayas, in central Himalaya, in areas uh, which basically uh, are transboundary, where a glove happening in Tibet um, but the impact would be also measurable in the downstream country of Nepal. So it's really also a political issue. And therefore, we also did some modeling results, actually, with a, a model developed by um, Martin Magli from Graz, from, from um, and looked so at the areas which could be potentially impacted. And most importantly, that the Chinese built here at the town of Nialamu a new settlement, and this is exactly in an area which could be impacted by a potential glacial lake outpost flood. And what I want to mention key for this study was a very precise high resolution elevation model generated from the arts imagery, um, which really enabled us to get very detailed results. And we already had, we um, actually had to revise our results because we got the high resolution VM only later. Um, well, you could also use SAR data to monitor, well, the different backscatter. What you see here, for example, the backscatter certainly changes if you have uh, ice on the lakes. So you can look at the ice phenology and you look, can also look at the changes of the glacial lakes with SAR data. It's another nice work by, by, uh, developed by Sunan Wangchuk, a PhD student of mine, a former PhD student of mine from Bhutan. And then, and again, what we need to know, I, sh I, I showed you, um, we need to know how likely is it that areas surrounding the lakes could fall into the lake or that the, the damming um, dam moraine is instable. So you could use, again, SAR data, persistent scattering top parametry, look at kind of horizontal and vert vertical displacements and look again at areas where potentially the a uh, region could be, could be unstable, which then helps us to detect the areas where we should go into the field, which should we monitor. Uh, well, if glaciers are changing, the runoff is changing. And first, when glaciers are retreating, they are melting, they are providing more meltwater, what is shown here, but when they retreat further, and the meltwater decreases. And a nice study by Matthias Hoss and Regine Hock from um, Zurich and now Norway, actually from ETH Zurich, um, they looked at the so-called so tipping point. And this is very important to consider 
And for the runoff, it's actually the tipping point when you look here and the Danube is already over in the North Catchments of the Alps and will be in the next, next decades in Himalaya or High Mountain Asia. But what the study did not consider is the potential contribution of melting of ice of these permafrost bodies, these rock glaciers, which could, at least to some extent, counterbalance the, the runoff. Um, and with this, I just lead over to my ideas for the Austrian Alps. I just want to highlight, you might think about um, that, well, the glaciers do not matter for the runoff at the mouth of Danube. But actually, that's not the case. When you have summers like last year, summers like 2003, where we have a drought and we have lots of glacier melt, even at the snout of the glacier, even though the average contribution of the overall runoff is only 0.03% in the August, uh, where the water needed, the, uh, the water demand is highest, we have almost, well, 7, 8% of the water which is coming from the melt of the glaciers in, at the snout of the Danube. And it's certainly higher in Innsbruck and in Linz. So it really matters what we do for the society and also here in Europe, certainly we can deal much better if we have a water shortage, but it's really important to consider. And this is what I definitely also want to, want to do here. I want to convert and also transfer what we developed for the Swiss Alps to the Austrian Alps. And actually I've uh, basically, well, together with Wolfgang Schöner and, and colleagues, we submitted a proposal to using old aerial imagery from the 1980s. For, no, 1945 and 1946, Jakob Abermann was the lead PI, or is the lead PI, to really um, automatize the mapping and generating elevation models and looking at the surface elevation changes and generate a kind of a similar best available time series of glacier elevation changes for the Austrian Alps. Um, well, this is just another illustration. Pastazze, an area where Victor went quite nicely uh, Andreas, you did marvelous work there, not only there, but also there. Um, it's, it's an ideal case. Why? Because it has a Gouglage lake which developed. We have debris cover, we have green ice, the highest mountain. Uh, so we need to know about the accumulation of the high elevated plateau. So it's a really nice test area to really uh, use the different remote sensing methodology combined with in situ me me measurements to understand the complex behavior of the glaciers. So I'm really happy to um, provide my knowledge and work together with you guys um, to improve the knowledge about Pastaz and other glaciers in, in the Austrian Alps. Um, again, Victor, Andreas did a great, like doing a great job on rock glaciers. And again, here we have a SAR, SAR interferometry image where you could identify this rock glacier, which was actually um, published already in 2000, and built up on this work and what has been done. I definitely want to continue this work. We, we are planning, hopefully we'll have a chance to meet tomorrow to really make details plan of kind of field work, really continuing the great time series, uh, which, which can serve not only, but also as a ground truth for other remote sensing data sets. And well, I really love this, this animation. I've shown it already in Carbon, right? Some of you might have seen it. And where the rock glacier really flows forward, uh, which is great, great to see and, and really using all the information, maybe extending back now to 1945, which enabled even better to understand how these features uh, react to climate and how they change. And there, the work which has been done is really, really great. Um, and finally, we have lots of conservative movement, like in Pizzo Cengelo, uh, really a disastrous event where people were even killed um, happened in the Swiss Alps. And interesting, they had already known that something could happen, installed a terrestrial radar interferometer, um, and you could see that there was an increase in slope movement, um, and then there was the failure. And really to identify where the failure can happen, combining all the methodology with really detailed, precise measurements with the instrument of the engineering geodesy department, and together with um, the, the terrestrial radar and uh, the remote sensing derived radar data would really help us a lot to better 
predict where such disasters can happen. I'm done, but not all. I want to highlight some colleagues who were really instrumental and important in my life. Without those, I wouldn't have been here. And well, it's first of all, I don't know, Michael Richter, you're still there, um, but you probably don't follow me. Um, from University of Erlangen, he agreed to basically take over, I don't want to recall this, but take over my, my PhD thesis and allow me to finalize my PhD at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg. He's a vegetation geographer, but he has some interest also in glaciers. Um, so really, thanks a lot. There's Ulrich Kamm, who basically had um, a project proposal about investigation of um, or identification of debris covered glaciers in the Everest area. And he asked Manfred Buchreutner and me whether we want to basically take this over. And I immediately said yes. And finally, this was the reason why I ended up in, in, um, in Dresden. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, William, and thanks for your email you wrote to me. Um, I, will, I will reply soon. And Manfred, you know where this image was taken? 2006. It was probably the field work, our joint field work at the Everest area. And I really want to say you need a person uh, as a scientist. There are some periods in life where it's uncertain. And when you're not a doctor, when you're not a professor, sometimes it's difficult to hand in a project or you need always a university where you need hand in the project. So you need a person who supports you. And I, Manfred, you always supported me throughout my academic career. You were not only a scientific advisor, but really a person, a, a great person who supported me throughout my life. And I'm very grateful that you're here. And so once again, thanks a lot. And without you, I wouldn't have been here. And in addition, he is from Graz, right? And through him, I know Victor. I yeah, well, basically, well, yes, I know where he is. And well, then I also have to, well, I will say this in, in the end, where I'm really from, uh, even though I'm German, I'm not German. Uh, so, well, to you, the connection of who Graz was there, and um, Bob Koska, Victor Kaufmann, um, Wolfgang Sulzer, I all know you through Manfred Buchholzner. Um, and then, it was, I had the chance to work at the University of Northern British Columbia through Roger Reed, a colleague of Manfred Buchreutner and Brian Nunes. And I took the chance and, as I said, I generated only one paper instead of three at my time. But it was a quite nice paper and I just met Brian a couple of weeks ago at EGU and we're still collaborating. And thanks a lot, Brian. It was really great working with you and getting the opportunity to work at uh, University of Northern British Columbia and also learn about another system which was quite important to me to not only learn the German system but really see how the other systems look at it. And Frank Paul, who was basically the person who was most famous for generating glacier inventories, and he heard a presentation uh, where also Roger Weed was there of myself and he was quite convinced and said, well, we had been a meeting and so we had a big project and so he invited me to come to, to Zurich, and finally I stayed in Zurich for 10 years. So thanks, Frank, and it was a great time with you. It was not always the easiest, but we always had um, really good exchanges, and um, thanks a lot. One person whom I want to mention specifically is also Zach Ben. He basically wrote me an email. You know, at the end of, in, in, in Switzerland, there's also the Wissenschaftszeitvertragsgesetz. You can only work for uh, maximum nine years at university without a um, well unlimited contract, and that was the time. So I was looking well. Well, I had projects I could finance myself, but it was not really uh, the easiest way, and uh, I was quite well known at that time already. Uh, so that wrote me an email from the University of St Andrews. Oh, we have a position, a lecture position. You might send. Do you want to apply? I, said, I was not really interested to move to Scotland, right? Uh, it's far away. It's not German speaking. Um, but it's, it's not a bad university, so I applied, and the best you, you, you can, like also he is, like, you're not too keen to get the position, but, but they attracted me. And in the end, they chose me, maybe because I didn't make a bad impression. And in the end, I stayed there four years, and I built up the remote sensing group there, and, and had really a marvelous time. I had lots of Scottish friends, and actually, 
Um, where is the camera? So I think few, few of, of you here from, from St. Andrews might be here. Uh, I really had a great time. I had a permanent position, so why, why should I leave? Um, well, because um, there are always downsides in positions, and there are also better positions. Well, I don't think there's a better position than here. Um, but financially-wise, it was not the best. I got promoted, but still, and then my family, my, it was COVID. I couldn't move with my family. And the kids are now 14 and 70, so we didn't want to relocate. So basically, um, I applied for different positions. And here, Jürgen Böhner comes in. You mentioned uh, the professorship with a teacher professor at University of Hamburg. And Jürgen, I know you would have been very, very grateful and happy if I would have accepted the position in Hamburg. It was a very difficult decision, I already told you. Um, but in the end, I decided for, for Graz, and it was not the worst decision. But I'm really grateful all you did for me, even though it's a pity that we could not be at the same department. And finally, Victor, it was the same. You just wrote me an email. Do you want to apply? I thought, I won't have any chance in Graz. Why? Because it's a remote sensing position, and there are many, many stars in remote sensing. But, well, I'm a person I always want to try, and I do my very best. And actually, I found here a small gift or something which I left at my talk where I um, basically applied for this position. And I returned here the, the second time in, in my clock, which I uh, used here to be exactly in time still here. And so maybe this was, was a, a good omen. So thanks a lot, Victor. It's really great that you wrote me the email and uh, that you also advised me. Um, and thanks for, for being here. But finally, uh, well, not too many slides, but I really want to thank. Um, when you do some work, I'm not the person who did all the work. You have seen as many papers where I'm a co-author and really rely on an excellent group. And, oh, well, I forgot something. You see, there are only males, right? Um, I couldn't change. I'm also male. Well, I have long hairs, but to carry it. Um, but that's, that's the case. But, well, so when you look at my group, 2020, only males, uh, Owen King, we are still in great contact, um, Sonam Wangchuk, Otto Nubatacharya, Sajid Gufar, uh, Gregoire, Jan Bauke, and uh, another PhD student from, from uh, St. Andrews, uh, Georg Kodel. Here we, we met in person again after the COVID time, and this is actually was last year. You see there, there's one change. Well, here is one female, and now we have even two females. And soon a third female will start, Francesca Valacino. So I'm really trying basically to have a gender balance because I think it's really important to have a gender balance. And so this is now basically, even though um, many are not really employed by St. Andrews, we are still working together and we are a group within a group. So we are basically the Mount Price Peer Research Group, uh, which is the I can hear. You may wonder why this is. And so really, all of you, thanks a lot. We had a great time, and I'm looking forward to uh, continued collaboration. And there are many, many students um, who I work and who really I supported, but they also supported my work. I don't want to read um, everyone, but really, thanks a lot. And if I miss anyone, uh, please apologize. I really did my best, and it was really great to collaborate. And Manfred, you may know some of the names um, from the time I've been to Dresden. And finally, I really like to thank you students and uh, that you're here because you know a professor is can do lots of work, but um, without the students, without the support of the work you do during your work, and um, I learn from you during the teaching, from your questions. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated. I love working and teaching, and I do so in the lab. That's my main task, but I'm also like with the students from St. Andrews, we went onto the glacier, I guided them onto the glacier in Iceland and showed them how a glacier in reality looks like and how it changes and what they learned in remote sensing to really go into the field in the reality. I love really training students. Well, these are not students you will see, right, with gray hairs. But so this, uh, the head of the International Center of the Mountain Development, he was there for, for the first lecture and also others, but the students are more sitting in the background. So really, I love training students because the better you train students, 
the better they are qualified for the job, but they also, there's a higher opportunity that they really provide excellent work also for our research. So there's a benefit for you, but also for me. And really thanks that you're here. And finally, I wanna thank my family. Uh, Monica, it was really great that you allowed me to do so and that you allowed me to move to Graz, even though my family is still in Constance. Uh, this was now three years ago. They are now even a uh, little bit bigger, um, but they are still, I'm still in good contact. I like them, even though they are teenagers, not always the easiest, but um, with, with Leah Sophie, uh, we will have a, um, a holiday in, next week in, in Iceland. And with Jonas, I'm still playing sometimes football and I'm certainly also supporting him sometimes via Skype or online, uh, learning French or any other thing. So he's also a, a great, great risk. Um, well, and that's, we are now almost through. Well, I don't want to read everything through, but um, I think what is, what is really important, what I want to emphasize, that really through remote sensing, through the different possibilities and also through the work we have been doing as a group in Dresden, in St. Andrews, and now here in, in Theo Dresden, Theo Graz. Sometimes it oh, still happens. I've worked a long time in Theo Dresden, where Theo and Theo Graz. Uh, but I think in, in a couple of months this will, will be not an issue anymore. Um, so really, we improved the knowledge of the glaciers significantly during the very, very few years. There are still knowledge gaps which we have to address, and this is what I want. I want to improve the knowledge gap, automatize the processing lines, looking at big data, um, and really stay at the forefront and the research, which we are currently as a team are. And what I really want to emphasize, the methods which I develop, we and develop, cannot only apply for glaciers. They can apply for many, many other land cover types. And I know that not all of you are fascinated by glaciers, but you see in my teaching, you learn for applying these to those um, subjects you're interested in. And these can be transferred and are happy to transfer and to support you and work together with you um, as students, with my colleagues, I really, once again, I'm really happy that here I have great colleagues, Philip, Johannes, um, everyone here, um, and Thorsten, and so on. So sorry if I, I don't want to mention everyone, so just look at you. It's really great. I love it here, and it's, it's, it's really good. We have a great atmosphere. So thanks a lot. I'm really happy to collaborate with you. And um, guys, oh, absolutely. There's a lot of potential for collaboration. We already started. I'm really grateful for that. And I'm really looking forward to um, collaborating with you. Um, and I want to finalize with these, these two photos, which somehow characterize my work. I want to apply what we really learn, the methods we develop in the developed countries together with colleagues from, I don't like the developing countries, but basically, um, really with colleagues all over the world to support them, support them how they can really apply and improve their knowledge for the benefit for their countries, for their society. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Vielen, vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Shukriya, Mosh Mokka Shataran. Um, oh, sorry, it wasn't completely right, but you know what I mean. Dania Bat Tajay Che Shishia. So, really, thanks a lot. Um, and I'm really grateful that I'm here. Most important, you can ask questions. But what is also important is not only to work together, but also have a nice get together. And what we did several times at here Dresden um, at the Carto Grill. I'm also happy to do it here and outside there's something working, uh, waiting for you. Um, I also brought, as I wrote in the email, some personal things I carried uh, uh, So maybe I've switched now to German, right? Um, so thanks a lot for those online you attended. It was really great that you have been there. And if you have questions, you can also ask questions like you all and please write in the chat or just ask the question directly. I'm really happy to reply. Um, 